Hello everybody, Jeff Olson here with Dan Foss Drives. In today's video, I'm going to display how to use our Smart Logic Controller, otherwise known as the SLC. The SLC is embedded in the standard software of our entire FC product line, so you do get it at no additional cost. The Smart Logic Controller allows you to create customizable logic that can be programmed into your drive depending on what you need to accomplish. Now, there are several ways you can use it. You can use various logic functions that can be attached to physical VFD outputs, such as a digital output terminal or a relay, and you can also create a repeatable logic sequence when that's applicable. I'm going to be using our MCT10 motion control tool to show the SLC parameters and also the MCT10 plugin that makes programming it much easier. Please take a moment now to pause the video to read the safety warnings shown here. Failure to follow these warnings could result in death or serious injury. The Smart Logic Controller is available only in VLTFC series drives. It is not available in VLTMCD series soft starters or legacy VLT drives. The chart shown here lists the SLC functions and quantities available by drive model series, and may vary based upon the version of software installed in the drive. The video will demonstrate SLC programming using an FC202 Aqua drive with software version 3.91, but programming is similar for all listed drives. Alright, let's get started. I first want to point out that I'm actually connected to a live drive via the USB port here, so I am connected to this drive, so that way as I manipulate certain inputs we can see how things react. We're going to take a look at Main Menu Group 13 Smart Logic, and I'm going to step you through the parameters associated with it. First of all, we have a group called SLC Settings. Now, there are actually four Smart Logic controllers built into the drive, and they can actually run in parallel and all be programmed uniquely. That's why we have parameter 1300.0.1.2 and .3. That would be for controller 1, 2, 3, and 4. This parameter here happens to be the controller mode. It can be either turned on or off. And then also you have the start and stop event for each of the four controllers. Now by default this is all off here and the Smart Logic Controller mode does not have to be set to on unless you intend to execute a repeatable sequence. We'll get into that a little bit later, it'll be easier to understand, but if you just want to use various rules such as a comparator or a logic rule and attach that to a physical output, you do not have to have the controller set to on. So, if you do want to execute a sequence, you need to have the controller set to on and then you choose a start and a stop event which would get you into that sequence and subsequently get you out of the sequence. Now, by default, it's set to start command for the start event, meaning any time that drive receives a start command, you would go into the program sequence, and any time the drive receives a stop command or comes to a stop, you would exit that sequence. So this basically means that you're living in the controller any time the drive is running. Now, you could set the start event to true, meaning that it's always true, you are always in the logic controller, and the stop event to false, meaning you never leave it, or you can set this to some customizable event that prompts you to get into the sequence, something as simple as someone pressing the left key, it'll jump into the sequencer, execute your sequence, and then it will leave the controller when the stop event for that controller becomes true. That could be someone pressing the right key or some timer expiring or anything of that nature. So you can choose customizable start and stop events. I'll explain that a little further when we get into the loop uh, or the sequencer and I display that. For now, I'm just going to step through all the parameters in the Smart Logic and explain the functionality of them. So to start out, we have comparators. These are pieces of a logic that again can be used in a sequence or just attached to a physical output. I've went ahead and created a comparator here or a couple of them so we can see how they work. Again, these are array parameters. There are 10 comparators. So 1310.0 through .9 is comparator 0 through comparator 9 for a total of 10 of them. 1311.0 through 11.9 is what we call the operator for the respective comparator. And then 1312.0 through .9 is the value for the respective comparators. So, comparator 0 here has been set to say that analog input 53 is greater than 
90. Now, it takes some experimentation to understand what all the values are or what type of number you should enter here. In this particular event, analog 53 is greater than 90 percent of the maximum scaled value of analog 53 which happens to be 10 volts so comparator zero would be true when analog input 53 is greater than 9 volts or 90 percent of 10 volts so that comparator has actually been attached to relay one here so when that comparator is true relay one will actuate so let's take a look at that i'm going to go to group 16 here where I can see my input and output status. This is the status of all my relays. Here is analog input 53. So I've said when this becomes greater than nine volts that comparator zero will be true and relay one will activate. Right now, no relays are active. We'll get close to nine volts and the relay has still not fired. Now we'll cross the threshold here and you will see that that relay will become active. So this bit right here is indicating that relay one is changing states as I go above and below 9 volts. So that is a comparator. You can use those comparators and attach them to outputs or also use them in the sequence that I'll display later. Now I'm going to move on to a logic rule. So a logic rule can be more complex than just a single comparator. You can have multiple things tied in. So I have created a logic rule that says comparator 0 that I just demonstrated saying analog input 53 is greater than 9 volts or comparator 1. Comparator 1 says that analog input 54 is less than 50 percent of 10 volts or 5 volts. So now I have a logic rule that's going to be true when either AI 53 is greater than 9 volts or analog input 54 is less than 5 volts. So let's take a look at that. So right now, this is analog 53. It's not greater than 9 volts at the current time, and 54 is not less than 5 volts, so the relay's not on. I'm going to go ahead and make analog 53 greater than 9, and we can see that that activates it. Now we'll reduce that, or analog 54 was less than 5 volts. So either condition here, we'll see, is setting that relay true. Okay, so that is a logic rule. Now well, let's move to flip-flops. This is a set, reset type flip-flop, which means a certain event will set the flip-flop and a certain event will reset it. When the flip-flop is set, you ultimately end up with a digital one for the status of that flip-flop, and you can also attach a physical output to RS flip-flop zero through nine. So there are 10 of these also. So, I've created a flip-flop that is set when digital input 33 is on and reset when digital input 32 is on. So I've created a little graphic here to help understand how this works. I've also attached digital output 29 to this flip-flop. So here we have digital outputs. Terminal 29 is a 24 volt output and I've attached it to RS flip-flop 0. So let's look at this graphical representation here so we can see how this works. Okay, so here's the flip-flop I set up. I'm looking at two switches. Digital input 33 will set the flip-flop and digital input 32 will reset it. Again, I have a digital output attached to this flip-flop. So to set the flip-flop, for this example, I'm trying to do a tank level control here. So when the water level is at this high level and this normally open switch lifts and closes, that's going to set the flip-flop. So that's why I have the RS flip-flop operand for digital input 33. So at this point, if the water level raises to this point, this pump is going to come on and bring the tank level down. And to reset the flip-flop, I have a normally closed switch here that would be closed when it's in the relaxed position. So as the water level drops and the switch comes to level or the relaxed position, that input would come on and break the latch. So let's take a look at how that works. That's a way for me to create hysteresis. I've turned the pump on at this point and I want it to remain running until I hit this point. 
For my flip-flop here, I've attached it to the digital output 29 terminal, so let's look at that. And here's the status of all my digital inputs. Here's the status of my digital output here. So, I have said digital input 33, which is the high-level switch, sets the flip-flop, so I'll activate that now. And we see at that point that that output came on. Now I'm going to undo 33, so let's assume at that point the pump started, the water started pumping out of the tank, and the high-level switch opened, like I show right now. You see that the flip-flop remains set, and it will remain set until the low switch is hit. So we'll do that right now. That's digital input 32. And we can see that the flip-flop actually dropped out. So one more time. Digital input 33 sets the flip-flop. I turn it off. The output remains on. Digital input 32, the low switch is hit and the flip-flop is reset. So again, a way to create hysteresis. Next we'll move into the states here. The states are going to be all of the operations that I have within a sequence here. So this will make more sense. This is, I could actually create a logic sequence in and that's going to be much easier to see when we open up the plugin. But as you can see here, I have multiple things in here. We have timers, certain inputs, logic rules, etc. So that'll make more sense. And I've put this all in here so that we can see how a sequence works. I'll move on to that shortly. User-defined alerts. You can create customizable triggers to create a custom message. So that's what user-defined alerts are. And user-defined readouts. Here we get a hexadecimal representation of customizable alarm words and status words. So that's for reading through serial comms and such. So those are the main parameter groups within the Smart Logic Controller. I've already demonstrated how to use comparators and logic rules and attach them to physical outputs. Now let's take a look at a sequence. So I'm actually going to use the plugin at this point, which is right here. So when I enter that plugin, it's going to load up. And I've created a sequence here. Now I also want to show you before I go through this sequence, you can use this plugin to create or basically to write logic rules and comparators. So here is a logic rule, for example, and when I set up that logic rule, it lets me set it up right here. It's much easier to do within this plugin than it is in the actual parameter groups. So without actually using this sequence, you can open up the plugin, set up a particular logic rule or comparator, and you can actually delete it when you're done or just leave here and it will have set the parameters for you. So it's useful in helping you set up these pieces of logic even if you don't want to use the sequencer. Okay, so now that we've looked at the various functions that you can use in the Smart Logic Controller, let's take a look at the plugin and the sequence that I've created. First of all, I'll show you that the Smart Logic settings for Smart Logic Controller 1 that I'm using have to be turned to on, and the start event for this sequence will be true, meaning I am always in the Smart Logic Controller sequence, and the stop event is false. So the drive will always obey commands that are coming from the sequencer. So let's go ahead and take a look at the sequence I've created. Since the Smart Logic Controller mode is set to on and the start event true, that means as soon as I fire up the drive, I'm going to be waiting here for my first event to happen. The little loop that I've created here is actually for a real application that I helped someone with. It was for a greenhouse vent. If you pressed a button one time, the greenhouse vent would open halfway. If you pressed the same button a second time, the vent would open all the way, and if you pressed a different button, the vent would come to a close. So that sequence is repeatable. So let's go through that. So I'm waiting here for my first event to become true, and someone presses the button wired to digital input 18. That's the open button. Once someone presses that button, the drive will run, and I drop down to my next event. I have chose for that event running, so I know that is true because I just told the drive to run. So now that it's running, I'll start timer zero. Here's where we can use the timers. Timer zero, and I see there in milliseconds, is set for 5,000 milliseconds or five seconds. 
I've started a timer and I'm waiting for my next event to happen, which is that timer timing out. So essentially I'll be sitting here for five seconds. Once this timer times out, I'll execute my action, which is stop. Now, at this point, nothing will happen until someone presses the same button again, digital input 18, and I've repeated this sequence. The drive will run. When it's running, which is true, I'll start that same timer, which was my five second timer. When the five second timer expires, the drive will stop. At this point, the vent will be fully open. Now, if someone were to press that same button again, digital input 18, nothing would happen. It's waiting for someone to close digital input 19. That would be your close button. When digital input 19 is pressed, the drive is going to run in reverse. Then I'm going to come down and wait for my next event to become true, which is logic rule zero. So when 19's pressed and the drive is running in reverse now, I will continue to do that until logic rule zero is true. Logic rule zero is defined as comparator five and comparator two. Comparator 5 says the drive has been reversing longer than 11 seconds. So essentially, if it takes 5 seconds to open halfway and 5 seconds to open all the way or 10 seconds, it's going to take 10 seconds to close. So I've said if you've been reversing longer than 11 seconds, so just a little bit longer, and the warning number equals 59, which is a current limit. So basically, is what I'm saying here is continue to run in reverse until that door is all the way closed and the drive has hit a current limit, letting me know that it's sealed up. Once that happens, then we'll execute my next event, which would be to stop. So at that point, the drive stops, the vent is fully closed, we cycle all the way back around to the top and we wait for someone to hit the open button and the sequence repeats itself. So that's how you use the sequencer. It's important to point out that the event must occur for the action to be executed. You can't look at things in parallel, at least in one sequence. So it truly is a sequencer. Some people will create sequences where the start event to the sequence is some sort of unique scenario. The start event could be a logic rule or comparator itself or anything uh, all the way down to something simple like someone pressing the left or the right key. And the stop event, same thing. Um, when something that you create a, a custom rule for becomes true, you will jump out of that loop. So that's a little bit about our smart logic controller and its functionality. Hopefully this video was informative and thank you for watching. Thank you for viewing. We hope this information has been helpful. Danfoss Drives can provide additional technical support, parts information or repair services options by contacting us through one of the following methods. For immediate access to customer service or a technical support expert in North America, call 1-888-DANFOSS or 1-888-326-3677 or contact us by using one of the listed email addresses. Additional information is also available on our website at www.danfossdrives.com. For contact information in areas outside of North America, please visit our global website at www.danfoss.com.